line next week, Anne, and I've also got to do uh, Lantwick Major. Because oh, of... well, 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 that man, what's that man going to do then? Oh! Oh, well, he like, oh, I tell you what. I go, go along, look, go along with it, and go along with it. Told... And I set up your Wi-Fi on your laptop, so it should be able to connect auto automatically as soon as you go in. I'll go in and I'll... I'll sit with Dorothy and um, if, Jerry, Adele, and Bill. And, and no, fine. but if they want to stay home, they can because they're only Dan, doing Dan, it. Don't, Dan, don't complicate it. Just get them in a the room. Oh, all right. And, and don't, don't, don't make a car crash after uh, you know, after a bus is ploughed into the side of your um, vehicle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, I, I Jess, I, um, I'm going to love you and leave you all now, right? Uh, and Jess, um, control over to you, babe. So I'm going to. Uh, yeah, no, uh, thank, thank you, Carl. So yes, and um, did we? Make, hang on, I haven't finished yet. I, <laughs> I always do about the chat before I go. The animated Bayer tapestry on YouTube brings this tapestry to life. If it's fantastic, uh, Pat didn't hear that. Um, and why you put just getting a paracetamol on here? I don't know. Right, anyway. So um, okay, I'm going to love you and leave you, Richard. I'll see you Friday. And uh, Pat, I'll yeah. see you today. Um, and Anne, best of luck tomorrow, and I'll hear all about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, um, see you, Pat, and Anne, and Jessica, and um, Richard. Try, bye. 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 Hi, everyone. How is everyone Hi. this week? Oh, okay. Hey. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. I sent a message to Carl saying I was in the grocery store. Oh, o'clock. He obviously didn't look at his messages. <laughs> oh. um, if you want, um, if you want, Pat, I'll um, what I'll do, I'll uh, I'll put because I'll put my number in the chat. So if you ever need to just contact okay. me, um, okay. oh, seven, hang on, oh, seven. Um, seven o'clock is early you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> you you lose track of time as well time goes really fast i've got i've learned that one um it's not yeah. enough days in a week and people used to say that when i was younger and i used to think what are you on about there's too many days in a week mm. um but things go in a blink of an eye um i have got my, my camera on because i'm eating my dinner <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. Pat, oh I used to do the goodness. same on the uh, yeah. on the Tuesday classes because uh, I did want people seeing me eat like a, an absolute monster. The food goes all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, uh, Pat, is there any news that you have this week? No, no, no news. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, Anne? Um, not talking on Shikiri. Um, Oh, no, I have got some news, but I'll tell you about it tomorrow. <laughs> okay, no, that's fine. Um, that's fine. Richard? No, nothing this week. Nothing no, that's really, fine. Uh, you know, yeah, I've I, I have found that I've got a got rather mundane life, I think. Um, <laughs> I had one of my friends uh, message me earlier. She was like, oh, uh, uh, she's been with this uh, boy since we were young. And she was like, oh, I'm, I'm with someone new now. She was like, I know what you're thinking, Jess. And I'm thinking, Wait, where's all this gossip coming from? Why has everyone got interesting lines? <laughs> <laughs> I sit in front of a screen all day, every day. Oh, well, um, yeah. I mean, I got gossip. My daughter's in Spain to see a boyfriend, oh, you know. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. So, um, it just hopefully the web, well, the, the web is going to be nicer, isn't it? It's different to what it is here. Well, it. I'm hoping it is because they do share very similar weather with us, especially in the summer. But, uh, mm. you know, because it's northern Spain, so it's, um, you know, more like here, really. But um, ho hotter in mm. the day, she said. It's quite hot in the day, but cold at night. So, uh, you know, and the cat. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, was, I was expecting snow, you know, and... Um, well, they say we're going to have snow or something at the end of the week, but I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, I suppose. Oh, they, they, they say it every time. Every, I think they said it back in January and it never happened. <laughs> and I was gutted. Probably Scotland. I, I, like, I like the snow. Probably Scotland. Exactly. I, I want to. I just. 
I just wanted to secretly put the chihuahua in the snow, really. She, she hates yeah. it. It's it just funny just to watch her be engulfed by a very uh, small amount of snow. And um, she's so yeah, tiny. They, they don't, they're very um, finicky, aren't they? they they're very, uh, they like to be comfortable. Oh, yeah. And, uh, mm. She's killed up now um, it, in amongst yeah, all no. my uh, blankets and pillows, etc. Yeah. So, uh, it, she she's uh, living her best life. That dog is, um, but we're not allowed <laughs> to touch her because she growls. She she's like me. She doesn't like being woken up. Oh, <laughs> Bless her. oh dear. But uh, I'll uh, put the screen on now. Um, yeah, yeah I, just, I, I just haven't got any gossip. But nothing. Oh, I'm sure uh, you can, delivering I'm leaflets. Sure you can find something about delivering leaflets and. That sort of thing. <laughs> oh, no, well, no, I presented a speech on Monday <laughs> in front of 70 people, which was uh, really daunting. Oh, but... that's amazing. Yeah, I was really impressed by that. Oh, thank you, Anne. Yeah. Um, I was shaking afterwards. Oh, I bet. <laughs> um, yeah. But oh. it, yeah, it definitely is, is, is a great experience. Um, but it, I think for me, I'm so used to speaking to when I was in class in uni speaking to mm. about 70 people yeah on zoom so it was okay whereas yeah when you stand in front of that many people you kind of think oh gosh and it's a bit yeah. scary um but we'll, we'll we'll go into today's uh lesson um I apologize if I'm all over the place um I've had a, a nightmare of a day in terms of uh, uh my uh dissertation and I've had about uh well, haven't had sleep in the last 24 hours, so uh, oh, we're, we're, we're running on caffeine at the moment. I yeah. actually oh, feel all right, okay. surprisingly, but <laughs> as soon as this is over, I know I'm going to crash. Yeah. Um, so the witnesses of the, Vi- uh, of the, um, of the Vikings in North Wales, mm. I know we've kind <laughs> of touched upon some of the things that we might have talked about today, but I wanted to go in depth and bring something uh, new in but also bring in um we discussed last week I believe the lead weights and I just wanted to compare them to some lead weights that have been found in Norway um but I really wanted to bring attention to these uh, individuals because I have touched upon it very 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 briefly and I went and saw these individuals in St Fagans and um, the way that they've uh, displayed them is fantastic um they, they, basically, the, the individuals were on top of each other. And what they've done is that uh, they've basically um, presented it so it looks like they're on top of each other. But when you look on the side, that it, one's elevated. Um, but it, it, they've, they've been brought to life. They have reconstructions. And instead of actually keeping them as photos, they've actually created it as, as a head and you can touch it. Um, and I, th- I think definitely um, St. Fagans is the, the place to go um, at the moment. I think their gallery is mm. absolutely fantastic. Is some fantastic stuff that's there as well. Um, I think for me, what was really poignant was uh, the Abavan uh, clock that was there. It, it, there was yeah. nothing else with it. It was just in a clear case on his own. Um, information was on the wall behind it. But just leaving it on his own with nothing else near it, I think he spoke volumes. Um, and, and it was just very interesting to... Uh, that I've always known a lot about Welsh history, but just finding out the little bits and bobs I've never really heard about, it was absolutely fantastic to go there. Um, unfortunately, they had some things taken off the uh, shelf because someone was having a look at them um must be for research but I thought how dare they when I was there mm-hmm. um I, I wanted to have yeah. a look at them all yeah. um but we'll be talking about mass graves we'll be talking about mass graves of slaves mass graves of um individuals that are thought to be um killed in a raid by Vikings and I just refer back to that argument I always have an argument whenever I talk about the Vikings is that we see the Vikings trading with people in Wales. We see the Vikings settling and trading with people in Ireland and in Scotland. And you have the Picts that are putting um, Viking um, mythology and symbols into their um, beautiful carvings. And you see it in Wales. And I, they really I got along well with um, marginalised areas. And I think that was something that the Anglo-Saxons really hated um they, they, they were catholic for starters and to see these um pagan vikings getting along with the areas that they've been trying to conquer 
that mm. I think they would feel <laughs> fi- fr- very frightened and threatened by them um, because they, they, they tried having a, a, a control over these marginalised areas and it just wasn't happening. And one thing that I have found with Wales is that the history is absolutely fantastic and we have the same archaeology more or less to England it's just we're I think a few years back in in finding it all and also discussing it all and bringing the attention to it but looking in the museums looking on collections online you can see how there's a lot of archaeology that has the basic um description but doesn't have the further discussion and to me, that, that, that that's really problematic because um, it, lots of people are dead set on finding something new. And it is exciting to find mm-hmm. something new, but there's so much in our archives that we haven't actually discussed. Um, my dissertation, for example, we looked. I looked at um, pottery all along South Wales. And what I begun to notice was that the historical literature, for example, in England, was talking about the same type of diverse economy the Wales was having. And um, Wales was kind of the same um, in terms of how it was all panning out. For example, there was no historical reference to pottery. However, um, there was that they were able to find pottery kilns, and it, we're seeing the same with Wales. Um, and to me, um, it is kind of brought on to that idea of um, maybe maybe Wales. Um, just needs a bit well we've always argued that they need a bit more attention but I think they definitely need more attention in terms of the discussion because we have the evidence um, and I even come to the conclusion that Newport is very similar to Bristol there was this fantastic pottery kiln that was quite similar thriving lots mm-hmm. of diverse trade and it, I think they were the hubs of their later of the later medieval period um, but anyway, back to this. Um, I don't know why I went on that tangent. But what I was trying to say is that the evidence is there for you to discuss. Mm. Um, and the individuals that are found at this site, they, they tell us a story of violence and bloodshed. Um, but what I want to do today is, is talk about some of the dark things, the Vikings. Um, a lot of the evidence we have of Vikings is very limited. Um, we do have some evidence in South Wales, for example, um, but it, it doesn't suggest that there was a, a settlement um, that, of Vikings. It, it seemed like we were just, we got along with them quite well. And I think one of the reasons why um, Britons, for example, as a whole in these marginalised areas when the Anglo-Saxons are reigning um, in England is that um, that they, they, they all had this common um, this common belief um, that it was very honourable to be a warrior, and obviously with Vikings you, you have Valhalla, and you, you, you go there if you um, if you're an honourable uh, warrior that died in battle. And I think that that, that the people of Wales resonated with that as well. Um, we see that with our early history. Um, in terms of, the, I'm going to say a word that Carl hates, but the Celts. Um, uh, the, the only reason why I say that is just because it is popped into my head with horrible histories. Um, you have the, the Celts, and they, they like to keep heads, and they, they were they had all their fantastic paint and it was a bit warriors, and I think that's why the Vikings got along with them so well. But if the Vikings were raiding all the time and causing so much destruction then how were, how were we able to actually know about their mythology and um, put that in our art to trade with them there was clearly a conversation going on there and I'm not saying that they didn't raid because that I think any group of people that go to another land that I think they are guilty of uh, something like that. But I feel like the Anglo-Saxons were a little bit more calculated in the way that they were. Um, they made themselves seem like the angels, whereas they made the Vikings seem like absolute maniacs that were coming to Britain and it, we, we all have to hide. Mm. Um, and... It, it just doesn't seem to fit right with me, um, with, with Linda's farm, for example. I generally feel like it was because there was a threat um, to, to, to the power of the king and the uh, the clergy, for example. They, they, they both want to keep that power. And so when you have these groups of people that are getting along with an area that are trying to get 
um, control of, it's, it's quite threatening. So um, I think you have this propaganda, this early form of propaganda of Lindisfarne, and I think that's where it's um, all um, come from, basically. So if I just get my notes up here, it's a little bit of a mismatch. Oh, no. I was just to say, there's, um, there's a, oh, a festival over in Stranford Law. Uh, oh, yeah. In Northern Ireland, uh, a Viking festival. <laughs> oh. They have it every year. And it's a, they say they row their boats, you know. It's all about the long boats. And, and oh, wow, that's there, fantastic. You know. So it's, uh, I'm sure it's a lot of fun as well. Mm. I must remember to go one year. <laughs> yeah, I, I know York does their own um, sort of little Viking festival as well. And I'd love to go there, but they, they recreate battles. I think I'd rather a long boat over a battle, um, personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, again, it, I think it, it, it would be something that I'd like to go to. And I agree with you. It, it, it'd be nice to actually enjoy it. I think it sort of put yourself back into time and enjoy yeah. the... Um, just like our north northeast side, sorry, the um northeast side, yeah. I mean, it is very, very, you know, close to Anglesey, you know, north mm. Wales. I say I, I, I say close, but you know what I mean. Yeah. At the end of Stranford Lock, you can go to the Isle of Man and you know, over to um a a Anglesey. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, so that, I think they're very connected, you know. But definitely, yeah. Anne. Um, the, the the Isle of Man was very important for, to the Vikings, just as much as Ireland as well, and um, Wales. Um, I don't know why they didn't settle in Wales. But we have a, such a, a beautiful uh, country, um, but we might be uh, quite fierce and actually scare them away. So, uh, I, I like to think of the latter. Um. But uh, I thought we got, I know we've kind of briefly touched upon this, but I really wanted to go into depth into this. This is Lambeg Rock, and this is in Anglesey. And you can see the excavation there. You can see that there's a wall um, and there's individuals that have been buried. And this is quite unique. Um, and it, it, you see how there's um, it, it different these defensive walls there and a lot of people have been arguing about the defensive walls where they built because of the Vikings and I personally believe that sometimes we just see a wall and we think it's defensive just like we say those sorts of things with castles and then we realise that they're actually not that defensive um, but it was the National Museum of Wales that actually had this excavation here um, and it, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to um, look at how they've excavated. That is a lot of work going into all of that there. And you can just imagine just finding all of that. Um, I, I would be really excited um, personally. Um, but it, but it, it's just such a shame, I think, um, in terms of the story of these individuals, because I think a lot of people feed into that Viking propaganda. Um, for example, St. Bryce's Day Massacre. Um, that was, I believe, is the 13th of November. Um, basically, Dane's Law, um, the, the, a lot of Vikings were killed. And modern day times, we find these mass graves and we're like, oh, it's the Anglo-Saxons. They've been beheaded by the Vikings. And then they do DNA testing. And they found that the, these two mass graves, they found one in um, Cambridge, and I think they found, I can't remember where they found the other one. It was somewhere else in England. Um, but it basically, a lot of people jumped to the fact that it was the Vikings that had done this, but it was actually the Vikings that were killed. But I would just want to flip it on today to look at the things that, that the people argue that the Vikings have done. And this is one of the um, burials here. So it was this, uh, the, the, like he says here, this in enclosure ditch and there's skeletons here. Um, and basically, two of these skeletons, um, they were in the upper levels of the ditch. Um, so they were lying outside the wall. Um, and a lot of people have discussed this in terms of what does that mean in general. Um, a lot of people have argued that this is, um, this is evidence of individuals um, being buried there due to uh, Viking raids. Um, if I just get my notes up, I, I've had to put, do it in a very odd way today. Um, foam just does not like me. Oh, no, I've gone the wrong one. No, go away. I think that is it there. So um, 
so what I want to look at today is obviously this uh, burial, but I also want to look at um, lead weight as well from different uh, parts of the world and what that means. So if I go uh, onto my notes here, sorry. Um, do, 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 do. So um, basically, th these these skeletons were shed in further light um, on the Vikings in Wales and the impact that that might be. Now, we know these individuals aren't um, Viking, um, but this was really interesting because um, basically we were starting to see how people were, were, I think they, they, they were definitely sort of looking for any evidence of the Vikings in Wales because it's so sparse. Um, we have the odd um, finds here, there and everywhere. Um, I do believe that there's um, some Viking burials in Wales and there's those fantastic rooms in Barry. Um, th there are some glimpses of the, the Vikings that they interacted with us, but it didn't seem like they were that interested compared to um, Wexford, for example, um, in Ireland that um, had a medieval settlement. But these recent excavations that were done in um, 2012 um, run by archaeologists um, of the National Museum of Wales, um, they want to look at this Viking Age settlement and it was on the east side of Anglesey. And this was shed in important new light on the impact of um, the, the, the Anglo-Saxon and the Viking Age worlds that are, that are operating around the Irish Sea. And th this skeleton, like I said, it was in a shallow grave and it was quite unusual how it was buried. Um, but a lot of people um, have been trying to understand that what does that mean for us um, and our ancestors um, or, or or Welsh people in general, or, or whatever you want to call them, because I know some people get funny if you sort of relate it to yourself, but I, I see myself as Welsh, so I just see myself as connected to these people. Um, but what I thought was quite interesting was how, it, it, again, it carries on this story of the Vikings uh, being very violent, and it, it just doesn't match up with what we know of them anyway. I, I know a, a women had a lot of rights with the, the, the Vikings, for example, and I know... Um, these other aspects but at the same time maybe the reason why uh, Wales got along with the Vikings so well is that we also had our own laws um, that, that protected women um, it, in my eyes I felt like they were pitting women against each other um, but basically if your husband had cheated on you with another woman um, you had a choice um, you could basically um, smack him and then smack the woman um, or you could let, uh, smack him and you, you get a smack back. But if you just smack the woman, you'd have compensation as well. So uh, it, this was uh, Hildar's laws, but it was something that we, we were on the same sort of level in some sort of way. It's just we, we thought it was better to slap people and that was our justice served, um, which sometimes uh, I, I will say, I think if I caught Joshua another woman, I think I'd give them both a slap and I wouldn't take them any either. Um, but... <laughs> it seems like they were on the same level and I, I can't understand why we always portray them as being very violent. I know the evidence here is suggesting that, but what we'll learn now is that that actually, ha it hasn't been confirmed. They haven't confirmed that it actually was Vikings that caused the death of these individuals. Um, so I want to uh, show you the skull. I believe this is burial five. Yes, it's burial five. Um, and it was in pieces when they uh, discovered this. So that they've obviously put it together since. Um, and uh, that takes a lot of patience. Um, it really does. Um, because I, I would uh, lose my patience. It'd be fun for a bit until you start finding pieces that all look the same and you don't know where they're meant to go. And knowing my luck, I'd end up gluing the wrong bit here, there and everywhere. Um, but three of the bo bodies have been buried individually. So the ones that are in the museum um, in St. Fagans, they've put the, the two bodies that were buried together. Um, and this is what is said on the slide here. So they had a double burial. So this is the one that's on show in St. Fagans. Um, this double burial um, was an adult male and they've given the age range of 25 to 35 years old. 
Um, but this adult male was thrown directly on top of a child um, quite carelessly. Um, and I think a lot of people, again, with this reputation that the Vikings have of being very violent um, and bloodthirsty, that a lot of people sort of relate this to the Vikings. Um, but who's to say that it wasn't the Anglo-Saxons, that they somehow got there and we have no evidence of it and or, or another group of people. But this child was around about 10 to 15 years old, but I know that the museum was given it given the age of nine to 14 so again dates can change but the um it, it was quite interesting to look at these um these remains and think that these were individuals that would have had dreams and conversations I, I do get very sentimental uh, well not sentimental quite I can't explain it I, I just like to think about the individual in great depth I might not know them, but I try and think of how they would think and what their last moments were like. And I always think of, and it's something that's in my head at the moment when we're talking about um, our Thursday classes and our Tuesday classes, for example, I always think about every time Carl mentions a, a burial or a, every time I talk about a burial, in my head, I, I try and picture what it would be like for the prehistoric people when they were burying their loved ones they clearly had care for the ones that they did uh, deliberately buried and it just makes me think of this as well but it was clearly um nothing for sad sad affair in terms of the family surrounding the uh, burial um they were just chucked in on top of each other um and you can show see how um how it, lack of respect the way that this man has just been thrown on top of a child. Um, they believe that possibly that the male's arms um, could have possibly been tied around his back as well. Um, and he suffered a blow um, to the left eye with a sharp object. And I love that they can find out things like that um, just from looking at bones. Um, because again, it just tells you more, I think, of how scary, um, again, it, I can paint a picture about how scary I try and put myself in those shoes. And it, it's almost like I time travel and I be that person where I think of how scary you would be with your hands tied behind your back and looking down at a grave with a small child in it. It must be horrifying. Um, and there was another adult male. Um, he, I believe he was older than the um, one that had been thrown on top of a child. Um, he was around about 35 to 45 years old. Um, and he was placed fa face down and he was turned to the left. So the body was slightly twisted and he could have uh, possibly also had his uh, wrists fastened in front of his body. Um, but there's nothing been mentioned about the child. So maybe it was just um, with the child's age. Um, maybe it was just easier to just sort of whack them and, and they just drop into the uh, mass grave. Um, but I will say I've got sisters in the range, age range of 10 to 15 and the, the Kids that age are quite strong, so uh, I think that you know maybe mm -hmm. that kid was also had his hands tied because what, once they've got once they get a bit angry, the, the kids that age there's no stopping them. They, they become the Hulk. You you can't fight back on them, and it, it's definitely a, a bane of my life with my sisters. But I love them. I wouldn't change them for the world. Um, only when they've been pains in the bottoms. Um, but these excavations were absolutely fantastic because it was it was a very puzzling discovery for archaeologists. Mm. Um, they, they were unlocking the details of life in the, the 9th to the 10th century in North Wales. So they were able to obviously reconstruct this, which we will talk about later. But it was in 1998. So the year I was born, um, they had this unexpected discovery that was made on the west side of this settlement. Um, and a lot of people have reconstructed the settlement as well. But five human skeletons were found on the upper level, like I said, in this uh, filled ditch. And it was right outside the defensive wall. So um, contrary to Christian, uh, usual Christian practice, all skeletons were aligned with their heads either to the north or the south rather than the east, um, which is possibly in, uh, influenced by the position of the wall. But they've been casually buried in these shallow graves. It was. It seems like it was quite rushed. Not a lot of care. Not a lot of thought. Um, and these that these bodies that have been buried in the three body. There was three bodies that was buried individually, and then you have um, two that had been thrown on top of each other. Um, and I like the fact that they kept the two that were thrown on top of each other together. 
um, because it was a young boy. Um, and I like to think that there was possibly some relation to them and that they've been kept together um, forever now um, on display for everyone else. Um, and the three burials, um, the, the, the bodies were covered by scattered limestone blocks and other smaller rubble. And this was suggesting that the, bur uh, the burial was shortly um, after the abandonment of the site. Oh, sorry, I just clicked the wrong button. Um, so the, the skeletons date, like I said, to the, the second um, half of the 10th century, um, a period when the Vikings on the Isle of Man, the Yuguan, I, I, I believe you, was it Yuan that mentioned the um, yeah. Isle of Man? Yeah. Um, yes, there you go. It, it was a period when the Vikings were on the Isle of Man, uh, effectively, and they controlled Gwynedd, and they may have had bases on Anglesey. And um, I think that the Vikings are quite known for their bases in terms of when we look at um, North America, for example, and um, they argue that the settlement there was meant to be bases, somewhere where they go and explore and they come back at the end of the day. Um, these, these skeletons were, were so interesting because they tell a different story um, to, to what I was expecting. In terms of the fact that I was expecting us to definitely know that they were buried by uh, Vikings or killed by Vikings. But unfortunately, despite that being the theory, there's no solid evidence to suggest that. Um, so the circumstances of the burial and this lack of Christian orientation have led some to speculate that these individuals were a victim of raiding. Um, and that the precise circumstances of their death may never, ever be known. Maybe we have technology in the future that can tell us that. And I, I wouldn't even um, put that past us, uh, really, because um, I know there's some fantastic um technology that's coming out today in terms of the Vesuvius scrolls um basically they they've managed to scan these scrolls um without opening them and actually read them for the first time in so many years in 79 AD which I just thought was fantastic but it just shows how technology is advancing mm. and that we can use it for things that we never would have imagined for and it just makes me think of the beginning of archaeology when they were drawing um, these sites and they were writing them down and then when you get to the uh, 1900s things are a little bit iffy historians are very hesitant about them and it's when we get to the 80s where this boom in technology happens you start to see the reputation of archaeology go up and I think it's only going to go up and um, from here onwards archaeology is a science and I think it gives you the facts that you need to further at expand on your historical literature um, that's something that I've been doing. I've been using the archaeology to look at historical literature and try and see if there's anything missing. Can we expand further? So what, what, what we see here is that these victims of um, military activity by Vikings could have been for the search of wealth, um, even in a form of hostages or slaves. Well, surely they would have taken those individuals. And I, I think that the Vikings are always shown off to be quite um, greedy, quite uh, violent, quite um, just very evil and negative. And it just sort of makes you think, well, this group of people that really have not been given justice because um, you hear a lot of things about them getting along with different individuals um, in, in these marginalised areas. It just doesn't make sense. Um, but these skulls, they show a number of similar features. So they have these horizontal eye fissures, um, they have square jaws, they have um, they were lacking earlobes, which I thought was quite interesting. I was talking about earlobes the other day um, because mine's not connected to my face, but my mum's ones are. So she, she's got earlobes like these Vikings, well, not these Vikings, these individuals that would have possibly witnessed the Vikings. Mm. Um, and produce health of evidence um, some features were suggesting a, a genetic relationship between the individuals um, either they become uh, belong to the same family or they were individuals from the same gene pool 
and I think that's because it was a settlement of very close individuals in the community. Um, but like I said, the, 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 the archaeology, the evidence being produced here, it's, it's a wealth of evidence um, for a settlement layout. There's buildings, there's artefacts, um, there's standards of non-high state site. Um, and it's also provided remains of individuals who once would have breathed and walked there. So uh, we can see evidence here of this, this stone wall. This would have been part of the cement was abandoned when these individuals were buried. So um, I'll move on to the reconstruction now. So um, I, I, sometimes I really do hate reconstructions because <laughs> basically if you look at these reconstructions properly in person, because I could only get a side-on photo there, um, they can look quite scary. And in St. Fagans, they do have a scary prehistoric looking uh, woman. Um, she's quite small, I would say she's about three foot in height, but she, she's quite scary the way that they've done her face. She's staring right into your soul. Um, and some of these reconstructions just make me feel a little bit uh, uh, uneasy. I don't know whether any of you have heard of, um, or oh, I've forgotten the name of it, I think it's surreal. Um, oh, it, Basically, if you ever experience cartoons or maybe cartoons that are, that are done on the computer and they look quite real, but you know there's something off about it, um, you can't really put your finger on it. That I feel like with these individuals, this reconstruction, I know that they're not what they're meant to look like. This is just a reconstruction. But I know that they're not real, but they... They look kind of real and it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, and oh, I've got the name of it now. It's a fever called Uncanny Valley. If you ever go and have a look at it, um, it, it is really interesting just to look at the psychology of how we know. Um, it's, it's almost like we know that it's not real and that we've got to be cautious. But the, the cartoons or reconstructions is really strange. Um, but the, the first face that we're seeing here was of burial five. So um, of this individual and their skull here, they've managed to reconstruct his face. So um, the top image here is what he, they think he could have possibly looked like. Um, and this was um, produced by the School of Art and Medicine um, at the University of Manchester. And they've done a great job. And if any of you are interested in reading about this in great detail, I know there's a, a book called Viking in Wales, an archaeological quest and Mark Redknapp of course I think Mark Redknapp when it comes to the Museum of uh, National Museum of Wales he's always having a his say on things um and he, every time I see an article on his medieval his name he, he's become a celebrity I don't know what he looks like um but I know his name um and I know that if there's a, a medieval uh, link his name is going to be there but he, he said this was absolutely fantastic. We're learning more about this. Um, we're learning more about how these individuals would have looked like. These people would have lived and breathed in these areas. And the uh, bottom uh, image is the uh, reconstruction of the, um, the little boy that we see here that was buried. Um, and then you have the uh, rather older man was thrown on top of him. So... It, it, Mark Redknapp actually had done his uh, research in terms of the Vikings in Wales in 2000, this book, but all of this evidence was coming out in 2012, so it was almost like he predicted it, but of course he had to have a say on it because it is his niche, this is his topic. Um, so if just quickly get on my notes. So Vikings, um, really, they, it, they just seem to be very problematic in the way that they're presented in my that's just my opinion. Um, but I just want to quickly touch on something. Again, Mark Redknapp, um, he had a, a say on this. So this is uh, the Medievalist um, Net um, article. Um, and the introduction was basically talking about these historical sources that records a series of terrifying attacks by these Vikings um, on the coast of Britain, France and Ireland, and from the last decade to the 8th century, um, Wales. And Wales suffered from raids but um welsh armies avoided yielding large um tracts of land to newcomers as well um and i feel like that there's a a lot of um things to discuss in terms of that anyway but the ar archaeology seems to confirm 
broadly confirm that the Vikings failed to colonise Wales at any significant extent. And that's what I've said. But then again, at the same time, um, do we actually know where everything is? Um, recent excavations... Um, at this site in 2012, they they were able to provide evidence of these cultural and trading links with the Viking world um, and a possible Viking settlement as well. Um, one or two places have been claimed as sites of Viking occupation, while a few Viking burials and hordes around the coastline have found but there's increasing numbers of viking finds um which is suggesting the occasional contact with welsh people but um there's very limited evidence on that but the first recorded raid on wales was in 852 ad it was sporadic um, incursions that occurred around about 919 um with rodri the great the ruler of gwynedd um he ruled from 844 to um 877-78 AD, and he led the initial response, uh, the initial resistance. His, um, his, his successes um, were noted in Ireland at the court of Charles at, um, the Bald at Liege. And in, nine, uh, in 903, Dublin Vikings um, came to Anglesey after expulsion from Ireland. Um, expelled again by the Welsh, they set sail to east to Chester, and they had this um, important development in the settlement of the North West England. Um, so the second phase of raiding started around about 950 AD, which was following the death of Huldar, the, the King of Gwynedd, um, my favourite um, king, because he was the one that had those laws about smacking uh, your husband. There's, there's other things as well in there, and I just thought it, it does make sense. It, it was even talking about divorce for women um, and other things. It was quite inclusive, I think, for that time period. Um, but there was numerous raids on coastal lowlands. In, partic in particular, it was religious centres. Um, so we see in Anglesey with Penom and you have St. David's as well, which um, it, that was attacked 11 times between 967 and 1091 AD. Um, and we even see with Lantwit Major um, and even Glamorgan are having raids from the Vikings. Um, but in comparison with the fate of churches in Ireland, Wales um, suffered lightly by the looks of it. And it may be part of the reflection of, um, the, of the poorer um, documentary uh, records they might have. Maybe it's quite limited in terms of that, but we shouldn't rely on documentary sources um, as a whole. Um, but this was a very peaceful period afterwards. A third phase then came to disturb that peace. Um, and this this was during the second half of the 11th century, so the second half of the 10 hundreds. And it was leading up to the Norman conquest. And so a lot of people attribute to some of those events to that. So I'll talk about what actually happened. So um, the skeletons, as I said, date into this, um, this second half of this, this raid, this very um, bloodthirsty raid. And it was a period where the Vikings wanted to, to, to set on their control they, they had their bases in Anglesey and so um, it seemed like that they were there to take hostages or slaves and what a lot of people seem to think had happened with these individuals is that um, because of the way that they were buried it seemed quite rushed as well um, maybe they were killed maybe they were quickly put into a burial um, before the next lot of people moved on um, and there was no signs of disease or anything like that with these individuals. It was shown that they were killed in a very brutal way. But it just makes you wonder. Um, there's no other evidence to suggest that the Vikings had done this other than individuals who died in that time period um, from very uh, horrific in injuries. And it just makes you wonder, were they protecting um, their settlement from someone else rather than Vikings? It just doesn't really make sense at all, really. Um, but um, one thing I wanted to mention as well, um, this is um, an article, if any of you are interested in articles, the only reason why I read them out is because I know I have um, someone in my classes on a Thursday morning, he always writes down all the articles that I've managed to uh, <laughs> legally download. Um, so you have transactions um, of the Honourable Society of Comradion, 
um, 2005. Um, and you just type in online Viking Age Settlement in Wales, some recent advances by Mark Redknapp. Um, it's a free PDF file that just comes up in Google and you can just read his um, thoughts and how he was able to go through all of this and actually um, actually come to some conclusion. It was absolutely fantastic to actually look at. And this is where I got most of my information from. So it was an enjoyable little read if you are interested in any of the, 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 the readings or discussions in archaeology. Um, you might not, but it, it, it is there. Um, so if I just quickly go on to uh, my next slide, um, my next notes for the slide. So oh, that's not what I wanted. I think that's where it is. But come on, load. No. Nope. Right, there you go. I've got it. So oh, move back. So th this is uh, these individuals um, uh, found with bear they were found with some artifacts as well um, and this was um viking treasure as well um that that is in saint fragons um but this these um viking treasures weren't found on top of the bodies they were found quite nearby so i think this is why people have led to the fact that vikings are there because this is a horde of viking treasure um that was discovered in um oh, sorry hang on um, this was discovered in um, 2016, so a little while afterwards. Um, but these artefacts are showing some fantastic things. They found ancient ingots, they found coins as well. Um, they even found, um, well, we talked about the, the hoard from Neo Carnarvon uh, last week. But you can see how these treasures are shown off in St. Fagans. It's definitely a place to go and visit um, in the summer. Um, and I recommend it because it, it was absolutely um, enjoyable to go there and really enjoy it. I was, I was in my element uh, when we went. Um, so the extensive uh, Scandinavian contact between Britain and Ireland um, during the Viking Age has been subject to uh, intense historical and archaeological studies for more than a century and this is where we're getting all the um evidence from uh now um where is it bloody blah sorry it, my phone's not with me today and i'm about to lose the plot right okay right we have it um so the new discovery um, of this skeleton really prompted people to actually start looking in the area, and this is where we're finding these finds. And they are on show in um, the St. Fagans Museum, so definitely worth a go. Um, so if I just get up my map for this now, sorry, I'm going to put my phone on Do Not Disturb because my sister just sent me a message, and I find it very, very, um, what you call it, very, uh, it, it distracts me, and then like, it throws mm -hmm. me off. Um, she clearly wants something. Um, she's not going to get it. Um, <laughs> it, it. You watch. When I finish this now, I'll be like, Jess. And be like, what? And be like, oh, can I borrow your hair straightening for tomorrow for school? Um, but this map here that I'm looking at, um, this is the distribution of inset lead weights from Britain and Ireland that's found all over the place. And I just wanted to focus on Wales. There's, there's obviously going to be a lot in York. We have a lot of evidence in York. And I talked about um, this area here in Ireland actually being a significant place as well, um, because there was Viking settlements here um, and there's evidence of Viking settlements there. And we did find um, a Viking rune stone here. And obviously this is near um, uh, Wound Head and uh, Swansea, for example. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting is that we have nothing in these areas here, not nothing in Cornwall either, but we have this big blob of it there. Um, York is expected, and I think it, it would be expected all the way down here. Um, and I was I would have expected more in um Scotland in all fairness, but um this is the um little mark that they have there. Um and this is uh, the, the dotted line is the uh, border established between King Alfred and King Gunthram um, of East Anglia and King, King Alfred was from uh, Wessex and it was uh, it was usually used to mark the southern border of the Danelaw 
Um, but it's quite interesting just to see how all of this is actually um, paced, placed out on a map. It, it clearly shows that there was something going on here. Um, the Vikings understood the importance of the connections of all these areas here. And I think these areas that we're seeing here, we are going to find more evidence. I, I truly believe that um, we are going to find more evidence in the future. But so far, they're, they're finding evidence in the, the usual places that you would expect to find Viking stuff, really. And it's, it's absolutely um, fantastic to look at how it's all dotted. Um, and I, again, I love York is a place where I touch the walls and I try and think of individuals that would have gone past maybe a child that was tantruming. Um, but, uh, mother was getting really fed up. She was trying to uh, pay for her meat, etc. down um, the shambles. Um, but I just wanted to show you these fantastic uh, finds. So um, if I have a look at the right ones before I start saying them out with confidence, so the top lot here, um, these are weights that have been found um, This uh, found in England. So all these here, um, these ones here, I think you can see that arrow. But all these here were found in England, these, weight lead, uh, these lead weights. And uh, it shows that they were clearly using that to measure some sort of form of um, currency as well. And you definitely see how is this fantastic um, design here. It's, it's almost like you see the swirls and the knot work um, and they're really unusual. And this one looks like I'm half across. But um, someone discussed with me the other day that sometimes um, some places the cross does look like a T. They didn't have the top part of it. That came about later, and I thought it was quite interesting, um, really, because I, I always used to it to looking like that, really. Um, but that, that was one theory that was brought up by someone as well. Um, and these are also these other um, lead weights, if I can just get hold of them. Just don't want to say them with confidence and get it wrong, because it is typical me to uh, actually do something like that. Um, oh, it's gone. That's not what I want. Um, they did find lots of uh, circular metal work, which is something that we're seeing at the bottom lot as well, um, which I will get to. So the bottom lot here, these were um, weights that had been found um, in Cumbria, Northumbria, um, and they've even compared it to, so these are the finds here on top that they found in terms of uh, Norway, and then the bottom part is then um, what they found in Cumbria, Northumbria, for example. And it's quite interesting to see these, um, it's not work, but it's quite triangular um, in the top part from Norway. And we kind of see it at the top as well. And I think this is something that we felt quite connected to um, and the reason why um, they were able to settle and trade with us, um, but ultimately just leave us alone. Um, something that the Anglo-Saxons had a great deal of trouble trying to uh, get them to leave them alone. Um, but the, these are fantastic, if you have a look at this. It, it, it is a fantastic article. Like if I find the name of the article, it's called Evidence of Viking Trade and Dane Law Connections in um, Inset Lead Weights for Norway and the Western Viking World. And the, these lead weights are absolutely fantastic to uh, look at. These ones are a little bit more basic and um, maybe possibly the design has been rubbed off. Um, but they're the ones that have been found um, a little bit more closer to home. And you have this fantastic, beautifully decorated one. There are ones to actually go and observe in St. Fagans. Um, they, they're absolutely fantastic to look at. They're right next to those individuals that I presented at the beginning of this discussion. Um, but these finds were um, that, that were collected in 2019, but these are dating back from 1985. And th th this is all just down to metal detecting pra practices. And I'm thankful that the fact these metal detectors and um, tech detectorists are actually able to uh, pinpoint what, because it's the context. It, it didn't lose the context. They were able to tell us where it was and we we're able to put it on this map and show what this means in terms of what we already know. And the, they found um, 154 finds from England, five finds from Wales, 45 from Ireland and 13 from southern Scotland. So um, majority in England, but um, quite, I would say quite a low amount for Wales. Um, it, it seems like we were generally left alone. But then again, um, have we have we actually um, explored everything? That's the question. And I don't think that we have. Um, but 
looking at all these ads and uh, all these uh, these fantastic weights and seeing how they're presented on a map, it just shows you, um, I think, where you're most likely going to find um, Viking evidence. And there's a reason why it's so difficult in Wales is because they just simply just didn't um, interact with us. And one thing that I thought was quite interesting was that in Cardiff, in Wombie Street, um, even though it's been argued to be a, a Viking name in origin, um, there's been no physical evidence of Vikings there at all. Um, but this, it's almost like there's hints of them everywhere and we just have to look a little bit deeper. So maybe our numbers could go up with these fantastic uh, lead weights. Um, so I just want to um, talk about these 86 individuals that were, um, they were buried um, and that they, they, they were put into a grave in Anglesey. It was a mass grave. Um, and it, some of them were stone lines, some of them were just chucked in. And they believe that these bones uh, were belonging mostly to uh, the Vikings based on what we can see in terms of their burials. So um, if just quickly load on this. Again, this was 2019. So a group of archaeologists have found a mass grave in Wales, 86 individuals, like I said, um, and the characteristics of these bones led to the archaeologists to believe that the bones belong to Vikings. Um, after the excavation, though, the archaeologists carried out further tests and they did come to the conclusion that these individuals dated back approximately um, 1,000 years ago. Um, but this was a period of political turbulence. This was a period of warfare. This was a period where the Sa Saxon kingdoms came over for power. And a lot of people seem to think that these were evidence of, um, a, of a Viking slave. Um, so they were having a look at the isotope analysis and it revealed that these skeletons were not the local people in Wales. They were actually a tribe that came from uh, across Europe. They came from many parts, from Western Britain, Scandinavia, Mediterranean places. And the archaeologists and historians who were looking at this believed that the aftermath of the Roman Empire collapse made a long distance travel impossible for a lot of these people. But the archaeological evidence literally blew the minds of archaeologists to the core because they had made their way um, from far away to come and re-sit in the, um, to rest in the island of Wales. And because it uh, is a, mess, a mass burial, there are many parts of individuals that they have actually mixed up. Um, but they, but they were believed that they were slaves that were brought here by the Vikings. Um, and this is a group of people that they would have collected um, all along the way. And I thought that was quite interesting. So they've clearly captured people um, and taken it on as their slaves, but they've been buried like this. Um, it seems like they were slaves that were kind of cared for if they had stones around them. So that just seems like a lot of evidence, a lot of, um, it's not practical, is it? it's a lot of effort. Um, oh, if my uh, laptop wants to uh, play, um, fix, but um, what I'll do, I'll, um, come to an end of this now because I just realized it's been an hour so and um, the story that we have of um the medieval Lambeg rock is maybe that, that we can never know we can just theorize we can argue until we're blue in the face until we have that de definitive um uh, evidence we will never know um and the, the evidence that is left behind is, is an echo, is a glimpse of a very different world in Wales um, where there's uncertainty and, and violence rules over everything, whether that be Saxons, whether that be Vikings, whether that be anyone else who's coming to visit. Um, but the stories of the Vikings do not seem to fit the evidence. And are they as violent as what we are told? Um, and that, that is the question. But um, a lot of people have sort of argued this back and forth. Um, I personally just seem to think that a lot of the evidence, yes, they were um, very scary, but I don't think they would have been as violent as what people make them out to be. Um, oops, sorry, just quickly clicking up on here. Um, we'll go away. A lot of people seem to think that the Vikings were part of the reason of the Norman um, conquest as well um, in their final phase in Wales. Um, but again, I think that's a large discussion for, uh, for another day. So what I'll do, I'll say um, thank you to everyone for
watching. Um, and I'll ask questions if I if I know what I'm doing. Um, Richard, is there anything that you'd like to um ask or add um today? Uh, no, nothing I can really think of. I think oh, that's right, Richard. More, you know, it's just a lot of the remains. Mm. Because all their any sort of dwellings and that they sort of built them wood and yeah, you know, there's possibly a lot more. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. Fine sort of thing, you know. Yeah, definitely. I think it, the the issue is the fact that we're, they they did build with timber, and so where are we going to find the evidence of that? Because it would rot away. Um, I think it, we have very good evidence of um in Norway and in York, for example, but that's because the, the water, uh, um, well, the, the ground is quite watery. It's, yeah. It can protect everything a little, little bit better. Whereas um, I think in Wales, even though it was quite rainy like it is today, um, I don't think these timber structures would have stood a chance. Um, but I think he is hoping to find in some more definite evidence, I think, that that would be fantastic. Um, so thank you, Richard, for that. Um, Anne? I just wondered what was the time scale again. I keep forgetting. So um, it's um, all right from the nine hundreds, and I went all the way to um the late ten hundreds. Right, and, um, but, and we we and when were the Anglo Saxons? When did they first come over? Um, uh, basically, I believe. Well, we know that the Vikings started uh, interacting with us in terms of Lindisfarne around about seven hundred and ninety three AD. Um, but I believe um, that the Anglo-Saxons came um, a little bit earlier than then. I'm yeah, so because the Vikings were after them, weren't they? They were after yeah. them later. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just um, got a feeling that, you know, they were... I, I, yeah, I am wondering about, I'm wondering about, you know, Wales, the coast of Wales. Uh, it, maybe it's particularly um, high, you know, like, really mm. high uh you know rocky and and high yeah. cliffs you know and, it was quite and, strategic isn't it because yeah, if you I think, thought someone was coming you could run to the top of the hill if, you, if you're fast and look down um and yeah, see the miles coast, the coast in ireland is quite flat uh, on the east mm. coast you know and and so it's like as if like whale uh, ireland you know the west coast is really steep so mm. nobody really, nobody really sort of, uh, you know, raided that mm. side. But of course, yeah, it's strategic. I think, yeah, I yeah. think um, it's to do with how easy or how difficult it is. But I, but I think maybe this this um, these skeletons, you know, maybe it could have been a murder or something. You know, like uh, the four of you know the the three skeletons. Um, you know, maybe the two adults and, and the child, you don't know whether one of them murdered the one. And, mm. you know, it might have been something like that. But we yeah. don't know, will we? We never know. <laughs> we'll never know. But it's been interesting. It's always more questions than answers. But, um, mm. you know, there's still so much more room for evidence, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. I think th there is. Um, and I think um, what we do have in terms of the evidence is fantastic. Um, yeah. I think even I don't think the fact that we have evidence um, and a discussion, that's the end of it. I think we should always go back retrospectively as well, mm -hmm. um, because you can always um, so that the evidence can change. You might know something more about yeah. these individuals as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Anne. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and Pat? Oh, I was just thinking it's a nice way to think of them as being <laughs> more gentle. Mm. You know, maybe towards the beginning they were rather violent yeah. rushing in, but uh, um, later on they just thought, well, let's just settle down here and make a home. Yeah, maybe they did, they tried, they were they were sussing everyone out. Maybe uh, that's what they were doing, <laughs> um, trying to find our weakness. Um, you know, it, it used to be they always said about the weather and what time of year they could come, mm, you know, and mm, gather everything up and uh, what yeah. they could and then go back home. But the, the trips were quite rugged, you know, really rough seas mm. going back and mm. forth. So, um, yeah, I'd like to learn more about them. And what yeah, they were definitely. Up to. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I, I think it could be something that we could go down that route of. I think one thing I would like to look at maybe in the future is, is York, but seeing Vikings quite domesticated, and that, this is just part of my argument, is that you see them with combs and they have these workshops and uh, they're seen as very family orientated. They like trades in it. They're quite domesticated. And it's very different to what we're told with the, the big horn helmet being raw and scary. Mm. Um, so it'd be, I think it'd be quite interesting to look at that as a comparison. Um, but what I'll say today, um, thank you everyone for coming and I'll see you tomorrow, Anne. Yeah. Um, and take care, everyone. Have a, a lovely evening and, um, have a nice rest up and cut up because it's thank quite you. cold tonight. <laughs> Good uh, rest thank you. I, I've got oh. my dressing gown on actually. I'm quite tired. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna go and curl up into a ball now with a dog, I think. Um, so okay. thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. If anyone's watching um, on YouTube, again, hit the like and subscribe um, button. It really does help us out um, and you get to learn more. So uh, what, what else could you want? M m mine or Carl's face? See, for, you know, for free with YouTube, unless you pay for YouTube. But um, thank you, everyone, um, for listening in, if you did, and take care. Um,